All right, hey guys, it's been a while since I've rolled out another one of these. I've been anxiously awaiting talking about Alexander the Great. He's the next one in the queue for the Warrior Poet Profiles. If you're new to the channel, Warrior Poets are those who uh, possess calculating, well-studied minds, hearts filled with conviction to lovingly defend others, and hands that are skilled in violence. That's kind of the idea of the whole warrior poet. So we're protectors, use our heads, good with our hands. So uh, that's uh, our aspiration as we're growing into that. Uh, Alexander the Great's gonna have great warrior poet prof uh, profile like attributes, but it's not necessarily saying that in every respect he was a warrior po poet, because then certainly he's not going to be in some. He has some very un-warrior poet uh, like attributes. But regardless, if you're tempted to change the channel right now because you're allergic to history, don't be a fool. You need to study and learn from the people of the past so that we can be inspired and understand by their example. We'll be better people. We'll be better warriors, better protectors. This is good stuff. So if this is like going to the dentist, suffer through it. It'll be good for you. Because Alexander the Great, first off, if history doesn't dole out the title The Great for nothing. I am John the Forgotten. <laughs> One day I'll be forgotten. Uh, but uh, if not, if history remembers me, I shall be John Lovell the Mediocre. <laughs> Alexander the Great is really worth studying. First off, I was drawn to him because he's absolute military genius. Probably, uh, I, I would say just in, in my limited knowledge, I'm not a historian. I'd really love to be and I'm going to take a whole lifetime to achieve something. Uh, like that, but uh, anyway, I've been studying him pretty, uh, uh, pretty consistently over the last month. That's why there's space in these warrior poet profiles. Is because I'll dork out on something, and I don't want to speak ignorantly or naively. Now, because I'm not a historian, I'm obviously going to say stuff that that I feel is right based on my study. But there's going to be gaps, so I'm going to do the best I can, and I've studied. Up so we can do this. But anyway, I was saying we're I'm drawn to Alexander the Great because of his just mastery of the art of war and also leading people. He was an amazing leader. So take this warrior poet profile as lessons in military leadership and find a great example in history of probably one of the finest tacticians that have ever walked the earth. You can uh, say uh, at the age of 16, he's always com he's already commanding. Uh, great hordes of people. He's a war general at 18 and uh, kick and tail. Uh, at 32 years old, Alexander, by 32, when he finally dies, Alexander the Great has conquered uh, basically the entire known world. Uh, and this is uh, far surpasses anything that his father or did. He's far surpassing uh, the great Spartans that I talked about before with King Leonidas and the hot gates of the Battle of Thermopylae. This guy went to a whole new level. Military mastermind. Uh, he, he saw science, uh, he saw war as a science, and that it is, and also felt its art. He was a charismatic leader. Uh, his men adored him, worshipped him, and feared him. Uh, let's see, had uh, incredible talent, drive, passion. I'm, I'm taking notes just because there's so much. I mean, I've written my own notes and highlighted, and I've got like arrows and notes and stuff. So I'm just going to nerd out. Maybe it's just going to be me and like three views on this, but we'll all dork out together. So way to go, warrior poets. No, uh, way to hang in there. Uh, so uh, anyway, but just his talent, drive, passion, and just sheer will. He had this great sense of destiny that he was going to go back and uh, kick the Persians in the teeth who had uh, beforehand conquered uh, all of Greece. So he's out uh, as a vendetta, and he feels it's his destiny to not only conquer Persia, but to really take his kingdom to the ends of the earth. Very, very ambitious, even from a... Uh, from a very young age. Uh, let's see, what else? Uh, let, let's start off, uh, he was no saint. He was no idealistic warrior poet. He was certainly a hero in many respects, having a lot of those attributes, but he's also gonna be a villain. Uh, some will see him as a, an inspirational king. Others will see him as a tyrant. So he, he you know, of uh, he has a Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde and uh, uh, to him as well. Uh, let's see. Uh, so, so for instance, kind of the bad stuff, uh, stuff that I, I won't uh, like is, you know, he'd conquer somebody. Uh, and then at the end of the battle, there's no Geneva Convention. There's no kindness. There's no mercy. It's just, all right, everybody's, uh, they're conquered. All right, uh, Q 
kill all the military age men and let's sell the uh, children and women into slavery. And he didn't always do that, of course, but he certainly did that sometimes, where he'll literally just raise a village, uh, pillage, plunder, and burn it to the ground and kill everyone in it. Uh, so the, the, there's that ruthlessness, which attributed to some of his military success, obviously, uh, but w at what cost uh, to your soul? Uh, so um, anyway, he was no saint, but man, this guy was amazing. And it's uh, uh, you know from a military aspect, and what we can learn from him in just general tactics and leadership, because he certainly inspired a following. His men would have followed him everywhere, and did. Uh, they'd follow him anywhere. Uh, part of this is uh, you know because he's going to heroically lead men into battle in the front lines in some of the most dangerous battles ever. He's going to be leading from the front, very, very vulnerable to attack, which is going to be a stark contrast to the Persian kings who are sitting in the back of the battle kind of commanding forces, and if it doesn't go their way, they, they jet and get out of dodge. Uh, but he's taking on, personally, hand-to-hand, -hand, the great champions around him, which means he's not just commanding men. He's like a top-tier level fighter as well. This is a very dangerous animal right here. Uh, Let's see. Uh, as a boy, uh, Alexander was a avid reader. He fell in love with the works of Homer. He's going to read the Iliad over and over and take it on war campaigns uh, with him. He'll uh, fancy himself a um, uh, Achilles uh, kind of uh, reborn. Uh, get this. He'll personally study under the tutelage of Aristotle as his personal mentor, and he's going to grow up studying uh, philosophy. He's going to be uh, studying history, uh, pouring over the manuscripts of his father, Philip II of Macedon's war campaigns, and he's going to be very, very well studied. Uh, as a, even as a child, he was somewhat of a prodigy. Uh, and we've got great historical resources, Ptolemy, Plutarch, uh, Arian, uh, where some primary and kind of second or, uh, you know, primary eyewitness testimony and some uh, historians once removed that are interviewing people that knew. So uh, anyway, this is pretty well-defined history, and this is all around the 4th century uh, before Christ. So uh, anyway, as a boy, he, he had this natural endowment of being able to read a battlefield. It's kind of like when Mozart saw a piano, he could just play. Uh, when Alexander, even from a young age, uh, he, he just saw the moving pieces. He understood uh, how to control forces, how to mess with the enemy, get inside their heads, screw them up, and just conquer. Uh, and so he was just basically a natural uh, warrior and always thought of himself, even while he was a king, he thought of himself as a soldier. A lot of times of uh, not even taking on uh, the comforts of kings in the field, bringing these big trains of tents and all the comforts and all their personal belongings that'd be towed around. He's going to sleep like on a basic army cot. Uh, he's going to be uh, one of the Joes uh, a, a lot of the times. He's going to roll up his sleeves and he's stacking rocks and, and digging out trenches with everyone else sometimes. He's going around and interviewing uh, you know, some of his own soldiers and, and, and writing personal letters to them and uh, their families. Back. Just incredible stuff. After a victory, and this is part of how he just inspired his men. Uh, you know, uh, of uh, interacting with them, being on their level, leading them from the front. Really, really good leadership. It's not like just do as I say. It's watch me do as I do and find your courage, do it with me. So that kind of inspirational, charismatic leadership was contagious and his men would follow him literally to the ends of the earth. And, well, until he reached India, they'd been campaigning for about 12 years of just, uh, you know, uh, doing a uh, hard, hardcore work. And finally his troops are like, please, let's stop killing. I'm tired of killing. We have a lot of money. Let's go home and spend it. And finally he acquiesced and that would end his uh, time. He'd go back to Babylon and then he'd die at the age of 32 after conquering the world. <laughs> That's amazing. Uh, let's see. Um, uh, he was courageous in battle, I already said. Uh, just kind of went, so I'm trying to pick up in my notes because I just extemporaneously just went for it. Um, well, let's see, let's talk about uh, some of his uh, military tactics. Just really cool as he's starting to uh, take on. I, I loved how adaptable he was as a uh, warrior. 
uh, whether he's uh, fighting the Persians, who are going to be uh, having an incredible amount more men, having many times the number of people, and when he's going to be fighting a million men with you know uh, closer to 50,000 of his own men. I may have got the number slightly wrong, but I am pretty close. And he's going to kick their tail, which is shocking. Which How is that a possible? So he's routinely outmatched in manpower, in money, uh, far from his supply lines, uh, on unfamiliar terrain that has been pre, uh, pre-decked out by the enemy to instigate his slaughter, uh, and they'll have superior technology. So, for instance, when he takes on uh, the Persians, they're going to have these cutters uh, built to their chariots and just basically go through and mow down, and he's going to uh, find a tactical way to defeat the chariots. Uh, the war elephants uh, of uh, the um, Indians, uh, um, let's see, uh, let's see, dot, not feather. Um, so, uh, yeah, the um, guerrilla fighters of Afghanistan, uh, he's going to adapt his forces, change their weaponry, uh, figure out uh, how to break into smaller units so that they're more mobile. He'll uh, use infantry and cavalry the correct way. Uh, there was uh, one battle, and uh, this is one of the uh, key, uh, key battles early on against Persia. You know, they're all lined out. This wasn't the million man one, but this was a smaller skirmish, uh, uh, you know, as he's making his march toward uh, Babylon. And uh, anyway, the forces are lined up, and here's Alexander as well. And once all the kind of chessboard is laid out, uh, Alexander takes, uh, you know, the, what would be his primary fighting force as the Persians thought and makes this hard bank way far. And then he goes farther farther, farther as if to flank around the outside. And the Persians have to adapt to this as well. So they immediately pull an element pushing, 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 pushing. And when they push out, it thins out from the center all the way to the flank, thins it out. And as that's coming through, a hidden force that was within the flanking element and then a centralized reinforcement unit plunges through with lightning speed straight through the center of the force, dividing, cutting the force in in that soft underbelly that opened up when it became overstretched and then just cuts the Persians' hearts out, uh, which is just, uh, you know, in incredible how how quick uh, he was able to make those plans, read a battlefield, and perfectly coordinate, uh, coordinate folks. Uh, so uh, just, I mean, he was fearless uh, in, in his... Uh, the audacity of some of his military moves. He just kind of went for it. Um, let's see, uh, some more. Uh, I spoke on his leadership ability uh, as a student, studying under Aristotle, big deal. Uh, he's a bit of an ascetic in some ways. He's going to shun a lot of the uh, um, sensual passions. Uh, there was uh, something I saw with uh, just a, a clip, but Colin Farrell does something on Alexander. And it's a Hollywood rework. It's got some little history pieces built in there, but it's all kind of like his uh, homosexual love affair with his good friend Hephaestion. Uh, Hephaestion. I've, I've read it a bunch, but I've never heard anyone say it. <laughs> I've read it over and over. Now I'm trying to say it for the first time. I'm like, oh, Hephaestion. Yeah, any, anyway, um, I don't know whether Alexander uh, was bisexual. He certainly wasn't homosexual. He was bisexual or he was straight. I'm not really sure. I don't really care, but they make this big to-do about it. He did have uh, he did have at least three wives. He had children as well. And in some of his correspondence, he's uh, really recoiling at the, uh, at the uh, mention of um, somebody giving them like little pages. Uh, these are little boys that will be assigned to a mentor. They'll learn war. They'll study under this mentor. Oh, and part of the mentor's privileges is they get to uh, now uh, rape, have sex with a young boy. And so this was uh, uh, more of a common-ish practice among some of the Greeks. Uh, but Alexander would uh, recoil at, at that a few different times. So, uh, you know, and, and a lot of the idea of his uh, bisexuality comes out of his really close friendship, intim um, intimate friendship with Hephaestion. So um, I don't know whether there was something there or not. I'm just speaking to it. I didn't want to speak about it, this at all because it doesn't really have anything to do with anything except it's just going to be all over the comments because what we know is Colin Farrell uh, you know, um, was uh, doing. So don't make this a whole homosexual whatever thing. I want to talk leadership, uh, military command, uh, and all that fun stuff. So uh, anyway, uh, I, I don't really care one way or the other. I'm not looking 
uh, uh, something like that. But uh, for sensual passions, he's not shacking up uh, with folks. Uh, he's uh, shunning a lot of the sensual passions of the flesh so that he can really focus his mind. He was a ma my, man of real single mindset. What really did it for Alexander uh, was hardening his body, uh, stealing his mind so he could conquer the world. He was on a one-track path to conquer the world. That was his obsession. Uh, now, he is going to um, get uh, carried away with alcohol. He's going to kill one of his real good friends, Black Cletus, wait, later on in his military career. It's going to absolutely crush him uh, for doing that. Deep, deep anguish and regret for that. Uh, but um, anyway, so uh, there's, uh, there's that. He also had a compassionate side, certainly not for his enemies, but for his uh, deep friendships. He's going to possess a pretty big loyalty. Now, he may um, order a murder uh, or so here and there. Um, but uh, anyway, after a battle, he would lavish on his men uh, great praise. So he would hear out who did great, victorious, heroic things, and he'd call them out and he'd praise them publicly. Uh, and he'd give great titles and lands and lots of money. He'd make everyone very, very wealthy, and uh, he'd do that. Uh, let's return and kind of wrap this up with the military type stuff. Uh, in uh, taking on, when, when Alexander was picking battles, he wasn't just picking uh, like easy battles, like he could check this one and this one. He was kind of looking for the biggest fight in town as he pushed on through. Um, uh, all of Europe, uh, Northern Africa, uh, Asia Minor, uh, and on into the East, uh, you know, stopping short of pushing through India. Uh, so um, anyway, he's undefeated in all of his campaigns, uh, in all of his battles up to the time of 32, undefeated, absolutely incredible. He's taking on the toughest forces in the world with some of the most seasoned military commandments uh, or commanders, commandments, uh, with some of the most seasoned military generals out there with all the money and all the, the up-to-date technology you could uh, buy. Uh, so um, anyway, forces much larger, logistics of war. He also is intimately tuned into the psychological variables of war uh, from the morale of his men, uh, understanding kind of where they were at, how hard they could push, and then pushing them uh, more. It was uh, he wanted to make work for his men. He's like, a bored army isn't good. Put them to work and give them impossible tasks because that will inspire a following as well, especially if you pull it off. Uh, so um, he, he understood superstition. He understood how to play uh, to religion and placate the gods. Uh, and when he conquered a, a place, he'd take on their gods and they'd take on his uh, kind of a pluralistic approach that the Romans would adopt and perfect later on with their pantheon. Uh, so um, he knew how to uh, um, uh, use uh, the tactical advantages of striking fear and panic and confusion into the enemy, drawing them out away from supply lines, uh, getting them frustrated, uh, and then attacking with lightning force, uh, playing on their superstitions as well. So he understood all those variables. And so as a military commander who was not just charismatic, energetic, passionate, uh, single, uh, singularly minded. Uh, he, he also had his uh, finger oftentimes on the pulse of his military and his men. Not always, uh, but a lot of times. Uh, a student, a tactician, he's got some wonderful warrior poet attributes and you would do well to study Alexander the Great as he is rightfully called. Uh, so um, anyway, I'll be uh, studying somebody else soon for your next Warrior Poet profile. Study his life. There's some really, really cool stuff, but hopefully hopefully this will whet your appetite uh, toward uh, studying some of the greats before us. Train hard, train smart, and read, guys. Read. Yeah, very good. All right, cool. See you guys.